this, if you can believe it, this is my first time giving a talk since uh, November 2019 at KubeCon San Diego. And it's the first time for our little group of maintainers to see each other in about the same amount of time. So we're excited uh, to see everyone again and give you an update on the project. Um, if you were at KubeCon San Diego or you watched uh, what we call the mini summit, um, We've given other updates since then. Obviously, there's been some virtual cube cons and other events since, since then. But I thought, you know, it's our first time back together in person. Uh, let's just recap the last two years for those who may have uh, seen the last 18 months as a fog and you don't really remember what happened in all that time. Uh, from a release standpoint, we've had uh, really three major release lines. The third one is just now starting. If you saw our tweet today, or the release that came out yesterday, we're just starting the 160 beta. Uh, but again, in those two years, we've uh, come out with 1.4, 1.5, and if you count up all the service releases and point releases, we've done 29 total releases uh, since KubeCon San Diego across three release branches, including at the time 1.3 was just in service, uh, which is now end of life. Also in that time, we've fully automated our release process. Uh, we don't rely on Derek to run some commands on his laptop anymore. Uh, we moved our entire CI to GitHub Actions um, and migrated all our sub repos and uh, have all that working uh, for almost two years now. Uh, the, the team at Microsoft, some of them are reviewers and committers in the ContainerD project. Uh, each one of those major releases, there have been improvements in the Windows support, in the CRI support for Windows, and now there's actually official packaging with each of our releases for Windows. Um, also in that time, we've, uh, one of our maintainers has added testing for ARM64. Um, we haven't integrated it into our release pro process. Uh, those of you who use GitHub Actions know there's no uh, built-in ARM64 runners, and we haven't been able to do self-hosted. But again, that's another architecture that's getting tested uh, auto automatically, and hopefully will be part of our release process soon. Uh, also in that time, we firmed up kind of our disclosure and security process, and we've gotten to test it with three CVEs uh, in the last couple of years. And so that seems uh, fairly well streamlined as well. And, and we even have a new role, a security advisor role, uh, that came along with rethinking our process. And there's some other governance updates. You can find that in our ContainerD slash project repo. Um, we've added new reviewers from multiple employers. And there have been over 370 unique contributors just in the last two years uh, to the project, 10% of those uh, are not just you know one time and gone, actually uh, have submitted 10 or more PRs. So we've got a great community uh, that's been continuing to grow. A little more detail on that, if you ever use dev stats uh, that the CNCF have, have put together, there's lots of other uh, community statistics you can dig into. Uh, you can see that 67 unique companies are participating. Um, we, ha we now have 13 committers and 14 reviewers. Uh, from, again, a, a good cross-section of companies, um, and we'd like to see that as well uh, as the community comes together to build Container D. Um, one of the other things, if you were at that mini sub summit or, or watched the video or have followed since then, we've added this concept of non-core sub-projects of Container D. So at the mini summit, um, I believe, Kohai was there and presented uh, StarGZ Snapshotter. That's now part of the ContainerD repo as a non-core sub-project. Image encryption was being worked on at the time. That's also now a sub-project in the ContainerD repo. And then something that didn't exist a few years ago but has gotten a lot of community activity recently is NerdCTL, the Akihiro, one of our maintainers, put together. It also is now a non-core sub-project of ContainerD. And one of the nice things about that is that it packages up, up a lot of these features into a simple installable uh, client that lets you play with things like lazy loading and container encryption and even rootless mode. Um, the rest of this presentation is going to be a lot about the what's new, so I'm not going to try and be exhaustive. Uh, there's tons happening in the CRI that Mike will cover. 
Uh, we've started to add the capabilities for open telemetry and tracing, more metrics. Uh, there's been interest from the Confidential Computing Consortium in adding capabilities um, into ContainerD around that. In fact, the Inclavara project is already using ContainerD. Um, and there's a bunch of work Maxim will talk about around Sandbox API and Shim and a bunch of rework that's going on even right now, which uh, we hope to get into the 1.6 release. So with that, a uh, quick intro. I'm going to turn it over to Derek to continue. Wait, wait a second. I think you just came off. Are we good? OK. So I'm going to talk about the deep dive section of Container D. I'm going to kind of go through the, uh, break it up roughly into three different parts um, so everyone can be familiar with what we're talking about here. So in Container D, we have the client. And uh, Phil mentioned Nerd CTL. This is one of the clients. CTR, if you're familiar with uh, Container D, it's like our kind of our debugging tool uh, that we ship with ContainerD. It, it, it calls into all our underlying functionality. Um, and then our Go, AP, our Go library, we actually consider part of, part of our client. And uh, if you're using ContainerD as uh, integrating, you're probably using, using our Go library today. Um, also, our CRI uh, implementation actually uses that same Go library. In the ContainerD daemon, which you're probably all familiar with running on your hosts, um, there we have our API server, uh, this actual CRI plugin, and then we have all our resource managers that do data storage, garbage collection, uh, everything around shim management, which actually owns the containers. Um, and then the actual container D shim is we have a shim that's per container or pod instance. Um, and this is what actually manages all the running processes. Uh, so to, to break that out, it ends up looking like this. You'll see the client all the way there on the on the left uh, box, you'll see the daemons actually in, in the middle and then the shim on the side. So in the client here, so this is, this is roughly how our Go library is kind of laid out. Uh, all image distribution is actually done inside of our Go library. It's not inside the, the daemon per se as a, a service today. Uh, everything that's related to um, setting up a container, so creating your OCI spec, um, setting all your container options are actually defined inside of our inside of our Go library. Uh, all the configuration for uh, the services, as well as um, so, like we have the ability here. So for the client, you can use these service proxies, which uh, talk over our gRPC API. Uh, but we actually use the same client in the CRI plugin, which actually doesn't go through the uh, gRPC API. It actually directly uses the service implementations. So inside the daemon, uh, we have our API servers, we have our CRI plugin, and then in the core, we actually have service implementations for uh, all of the all the services that we define. Uh, so everything that related to containers, related to accessing content, relax accessing the actual images, uh, namespaces, and snapshots, uh, all have a definition here, um, and the API gives you access to those through, uh, through gRPC. So if you know the ContainerD API today, you might be familiar with some of our, uh, some of these APIs. They're very low level. If you're used to using Docker, there's probably a lot of stuff here that you wouldn't necessarily use directly. Um, you'd see stuff more that you're used to, pull push inside, uh, inside the actual Go library. And then here's where we actually do our data storage. So in our metadata layer, this is where we store everything related to um, any sort of label you have, every single image, uh, what it stores, uh, every snapshot, every container is actually stored here. And we have a garbage collection process that will go in and it will delete stuff that's, that's no, longer, uh, no longer referenced by anything. Um, and that's so that we can have our approach of failing clean. So if, if something becomes unreferenced, uh, we'll clean it up. Uh, the back end underneath that, uh, this is where the actual snapshots will live, the actual large content blobs that you pull down from the registry, um, the actual clients that, that talk to the, the shims are at this layer here. Um, 
and uh, the metadata layer will actually manage everything that's done there. So the shims, this is probably where you've seen a lot of, uh, a lot of discussion lately around, you have GVisor, Kata containers, uh, Run C, which everybody knows, Firecracker, uh, all implement this, this shim interface. Um, and what this allows us to do is to separate the underlying container implementation from our actual resource management of that container. So from a container D perspective, we can treat uh, these shims as a resource. Um, we don't have to worry about uh, everything that's being managed necessarily underneath it, uh, whether you're using C groups or you have a, a VM implementation. All of that's actually related to how the shim implements that. Um, and we can, we can uh, implement it a little bit more abstractly. Uh, I've added since uh, the last time we did this talk, um, actually, I guess we didn't have this two years ago, this, this diagram, but at least since, since last KubeCon, we have the Sandbox Manager. Um, that's a new interface that, that we're adding um, and will be discussed by, uh, I think Maxim is going to discuss a little bit more coming up. All right, so let's, let's quickly go through what a, what a poll looks like in this diagram. So when you do a poll, the first thing that's gonna be done is we're gonna get a lease. And a lease in container D is basically a way to tell the garbage collector that I'm using this content right now. And if something fails, then uh, the garbage collector will eventually clean it up when that, once that lease expires. Uh, so this is our way of, as we all know, like polling sometimes doesn't always complete or your process gets killed randomly. Uh, we, don't, we always try to make sure we never leave anything around. Um, so after that, the pull process is actually gonna resolve uh, your content. Um, so it's gonna resolve your tag to uh, some OCI registry. It's gonna grab that, that data from the OCI registry and it's gonna go into the content store. And the path it's gonna make from the client is through gRPC, through our service layer, uh, through our metadata layer, and then actually to the storage. Um, after that, uh, every pull, uh, you're gonna unpack that into disk uh, so the poll is going to actually create the snapshots. And then for every snapshot it creates, it's going to unpack that data using our, uh, using our diff service. And all the diff service does is it takes these layers um, and it unpacks them into, into the snapshots. And then after that, we can just create an image. Um, this is the lightest weight part. It just links to the content that, that we've now unpacked uh, on disk. Uh, Likewise, let me go through a run flow real quick. You'll kind of see, uh, unlike poll, we don't have a we don't have a top level run function. Um, so nerd CTL or CTR will actually like orchestrate these. Um, it's going to do the same thing first. It's going to grab uh, it's going to grab a lease, and then it's actually going to go resolve your image. Normally, when you run a container, you start with an image. Uh, in this case, it's just going to read what that is. It's going to resolve that. It's going to look at the image configuration, so it's going to resolve all that, read the content so that it can actually resolve your, uh, resolve your uh, configuration that you want to use for your container. It's going to set up the snapshot, so there's normally the read-write layer that you're going to use inside of your container. It's going to create the OCI uh, specification, so it's going to use that image config that it read uh, back from the content store. It's going to use those uh, to generate this OCI configuration, um, create the container. Um, now, in this case, the container is actually a metadata object that we use in container D to keep track of container as a resource. Um, and then after that is where we actually start the tasks. And the tasks here uh, doesn't actually have data that we store in container D. You can see it kind of skips over our storage layer there and goes directly to uh, the back end. Um, that's because tasks are, are the ephemeral object that are associated with the actual running container. Um, if you were to restart your machine at this point, we would still see that container metadata, but you wouldn't see any of your task data um, with, how it's, with how it's implemented today. And in this case, um, all your remaining uh, operations are going to be actually through this task interface. So you're going to start the container, you're going to wait for the container, uh, you're going to exec or kill or whatever are gonna do is actually gonna go through the same flow uh, from the client all the way back to uh, the shim. And as I mentioned before, 
Uh, I added sandboxes in here. This is something that, that we're in the process of adding. Uh, we don't have a flow all the way back through the client today because the sandbox API is still being worked on. Um, but this is one of the areas that we're worked on. We're working on today. Uh, so this will help in cases where you have a VM sandbox, you'll actually be able to manage, uh, manage that sandbox through the ContainerD API in the lifecycle. Um, so this, is, this will be useful for some of the more advanced use cases uh, that, that will be discussed later. Um, so now we're going to dig into CRI a little deeper with uh, Mike. Hey guys, well you said deeper, but really I'm gonna step back a bit and talk more about our, our, how we interact with Kubernetes itself. Okay, as I'm, I'm sure a lot of you guys are you know, Kubernetes users and you don't really know what goes on in Node, except that you configure a container runtime. So I'll, I'll go ahead and talk about this a little bit. Um, the, the concept, the idea is on your node, you have Kubelet registering with API server to host all the pods and resource types that pods need on, on the node, on the worker node, right? And it's the job of Kubelet to, to run its managers and converse with the container runtime, allocate volumes and, and attach things to, to the container through these cry APIs, okay? The cry APIs were, were done by Tim, some, some, you know, some guys in Google uh, probably about five years ago um, as, as a way to to modify how it currently we were integrating with Docker, right, for, for launching containers and managing. Uh, it, we thought it'd be a good idea to have a, a cry API so that other people could come in and implement without having to fork Kubelet, which is basically what we were doing originally. We, we had, there was a rock and eddies and you know, a, a Docker fork. And, and currently we, let's go ahead, uh, let's see, let's go to the next chart down here. Currently, there's some code in Kubelet that implements the Docker shim, and it, you can actually find the tree in there. And when Kubelet comes up, it launches the Docker shim uh, to to host these cry services. But they also have some internal, you know, integration, you know, techniques and, and things that are in there. And it was decided that all that stuff needs to be pushed over into the cry, so that the container runtimes that are running using only the cry interface would have, you know, more legitimate. API to work with, um, it, it just felt easier. So what we're gonna do, and what has been happened, is we've deprecated Docker Shim. That's the internal version, not the external version. The external version of Docker Shim is still being worked on. It'll still work with Docker. Um, I don't know if you know about it, but underneath the covers, Docker actually uses ContainerD also. Um, that's another, another piece of information. But we, we've got some work going in a way to make all the test buckets work for the container runtimes, either cryo and or container D, um, so that you guys will be able to you know, trust that everything that can happen with Docker can also happen with these other container runtime types that you're all migrating to. When it gets completely pulled out, I guess maybe 124 or 125, we'll see what happens, okay? Uh, along this route, we've just, the, the cry API was, has been in alpha for about three years. I'm sure you know the, the API cycle for Kubernetes APIs can be very long. Um, but we are moving to a, a version one beta uh, status, and Sasha has a, a pull request in there right now to, to add the V1 API as an optional API in the 2.3 cycle. Um, so, you know, one V1, the V1, 2.3 uh, Kubernetes. Uh, so what, what we're gonna do is make sure that all of the container runtimes that implement the cry interface support both the V1 alpha API and, and the V1 API at the same time. So when Kubelet comes up, it'll check to see if you've got V1 in the container runtime or not. If you, if you have V1, it'll go ahead and start using that uh, as soon as this, this PR gets merged in, in, in 2.3 of Kubernetes and Kubelet. And, and then it'll all be great, right? And then later on, if container D reboots and, and you have to reconnect Kubelet to container D, then it'll be using continually using the V1 API. If, however, you're using an older version of container D or cryo, and it's connected initially to the V1 alpha API, then it'll still be using the V1 alpha API unless you reboot Kubelet. 
and then it'll recheck to see if the B1 is there. Just to give you an idea that, yes, there's going to be a migration kind of issue, but we're going to tackle it in the container runtimes and in Kubelet to be okay with either one migrating up, but you'd have to reboot both to get up to the next version of the API. And I imagine we'll do the same thing when we go from the V1 beta to, to the V1 GA. Okay, so that's going to happen. Confidential computing. Very exciting, a lot of interesting stuff going on uh, in multi-tenancy. We, we've run into some issues. The, one of the oldest issues in, in Kubernetes is, is a little problem with if a pod A pulls an image down to the, down to the node and pod B wants to use that image and you're only, you're only saying uh, pull if not present, then it'll, pod B will get to use the image from the first pull whether or not it had access to it. So if you're storing an image as a private image with, that can only get accessed with a password, you know, an authentication, then it may already be on the node. So what we want to do with this ensure, uh, ensure secret you know, images is, is actually check and, and keep a running list of who actually pulled it and whether authors require it or not. Uh, if you follow these links, you'll, you'll find the, the cap. It's been approved for one, two, three, and, and it's, and we've got the, the code for it as well. Um, just, just a heads up, you know, this, this problem should be fixed. However, the, the workaround right now for multi-tenancy is to force a you know, controller to always say pull always. Now, if you use pull always policy, image policy, then what the container runtimes will do is only pull the manifest. So if, the, if it's a one gigabyte image, it's only gonna pull the manifest part to make sure that you have, that, that you have authentication. Okay, and, and if we've got it already locally cached, we'll just use that, those blobs, okay? Let's see. The, the other thing that we've been running into a lot with confidential computing is that we, we need this, this ability to decide where we want to store the, the container image cache information, the metadata information, the snapshotted images, and you know, in whatever data that you're storing in your in your container, and what the CATA containers guys want to do, and a, few, and a few other groups, is is to put that information inside the virtual machine. It sounds like it'll be expensive, but it, it'll be very secure. And so instead of right now we pull the images and cache them on on your host, what'll happen is if you if you say you want a runtime handler handler to be secure CATA containers you know, with internal, then that runtime handler switch would go to a configuration that's pointing to pull the image into the virtual machine. All right, so, so that's going on. Uh, we can answer questions on this later on. I'm hoping you guys are interested. So another, another set of changes that we, we would want to do, um, if, you, if you're looking at Knative or Istio, or some, some other situations where maybe edge type situations where you want the pods to be really, really fast. Well, there's, there's a, a somewhat, a couple of problems with the way Kubernetes is currently designed. It wasn't designed to run pods, you know, every couple of milliseconds. It was designed to run, run pods based on, you know, how they've been deployed and distributed around the node and then after a couple of minutes, we'll check to see if they're finished or not, and if they're still running. And then, and then we, and if they're not, we'll rerun the pods and keep matching the contract that you have. But Kubernetes isn't really built for that contract is, you know, just a couple of milliseconds for a quick service, or even a portion, even a half a second or two seconds. So what we'd like to do is improve how we handle probes um, to move them from a, a per second kind of kind of level to milliseconds, um, and we'd also like to change the, the kube process, kubelet process actually, for, for how it determines the current state of pods. Today, it determines the current state on a, a configurable, but default, I believe it is two minute pro, uh, cycle time. So it, it, you won't know at the scheduler side until after a couple of minutes, whether or not you, know, you need to run another pod. And that's not really fast enough for you know for a K native kind of kind of scenario. So we'd like to move to a subscription process. It sounds it sounds obvious. We'll go with eventing. We already have eventing support for tasks inside of 
inside of the runtime uh, container. So we, we'd like to move that outside. And that's, that's it. Okay. Um, I'd like to briefly highlight uh, what we've been working on lately and what to expect in upcoming container D releases. Uh, we plan to focus, to focus more on our Shim V2 runtime, the one responsible for container task, tasks and for managing Shim processes. Uh, up to container D 1.5, Shim runtime interface didn't change much. So we implement just one runtime service called uh, task service to manage the whole container lifecycle. And it was sufficient to run containers or, and even to launch pods and boxes. However, with micro VMs, there are a lot of new uh, use cases that we want to cover. There are some new use cases that drive runtime changes that we are working on. Uh, Sandbox API is ongoing effort for quite a while. The goal is to make micro VM or any other Sandbox first class citizen in container D. Uh, there is an effort with confidential container, containers to apply more security on container images so the host can't access sensitive data that the image may contain. Uh, there is also a proposal to add port forwarding API to our shims, and there are many more, many more potential use cases that we are not yet aware. Uh, for the new runtime, we added plugin support to our shims in 1.6 beta. They use the same plugin system as Continuity Demon, so it's easy to add new services to the runtime, uh, depend, define dependencies between these plugins, and so on. And in order to support new services on Demon side, we want to introduce new Shim service that will manage Shim's processes independently from API that these uh, Shims implement. And we give more controls to client how to schedule and how to manage uh, workloads through Continuity APIs. A quick recap how our runtime system works today. Uh, so as, as I mentioned, Shim implement interface called task service and Continuity Daemon offers same backend API uh, to manage tasks from client, uh, which hides the communication, the underlying communication with the runtime. So whenever we launch container from client, we uh, call Continuity task service API and behind the scene it starts a new Shim process for us and then it forwards creates request to, to that shim we just created. Same applies to subsequent calls. Uh, Containerd keeps the list of running shims, looks for the one we need, and forwards requests to proper instance. With the new approach, we allow to call shims API directly. So Containerd still manages uh, shim processes lifecycle, so we can ask Containerd to start a uh, new shim for us or request existing one by ID. Uh, but container D daemon is not aware what kind of services particular shim implements. Instead, we'll let container D client to talk to shim and de depending, depending on services runtime offer, client can decide proper flow of calls. So for instance, if shim implements the service, we launch container from client like we, the same way we do it today. If in addition to that shim supports inbox API, client can start Sandbox, inst sandbox instance before launching containers. If, in addition to that, Shim supports confidential containers APIs, client can, can prepare image for that sandbox. And this is flexible enough to enable all kind of uh, service combinations and support. It's easy to support new use cases. The concept behind Shim service is really simple. Um, it can create and it can delete Shims. Uh, to be precise, we already do that today. We just split existing task service um, to manage shims and tas tasks independently as two different plugins. And we'll expose its API to clients so clients can control shims. Um, Containerd still expects to track uh, shim lifecycle, so whenever shim process dies, Containerd will clean it up. Uh, this service is going to be a foundation for high-level services which depend on specific shim implementations. Uh, task service is the only service we require to, implement, to be implemented today, so Containerd can launch new containers by first calling a shim service to start new shim instance, and then by calling task service API from that shim. And this way we keep 
backward compatibility with uh, previous uh, versions of ContainerD. Uh, same way, Sandbox API will invoke different set of services offered by Shims. Um, Sandbox API will be one of one more consumer of Shim service. Uh, it aims to bring a notion of group of containers to ContainerD. The goal is to provide a well-defined Shim interface to Task, task API. So, uh, that can be used um, to add new sandbox implementations and runtime level. Behind sandbox concept can be really anything depending on how runtime implements it. So, for instance, it can be post container, micro VM, or even virtual machine. Um, that's all I have. Thank you so much for listening, and we'll be happy to answer your questions.